I was sitting around with some jazz friends up in Woodstock, and we were all actually rather stoned at the time when this call got forwarded up to me from my home phone down in New York. And this voice said, we would like to use some of your music to contract, contact extraterrestrial life. And I thought, who are you? Come on, what kind of a joke is this? Can you send me like a confirmation on NASA letterhead that this is legit, you know, figuring I'd never hear from them again, but they weren't NASA. And um, anyway, that just happened. In the late summer of 1977, two unmanned spacecraft, Voyager 1 and 2, lifted off from Cape Canaveral atop Titan Centaur rockets. Traveling uninterrupted through interstellar space, the Voyagers will endure forever, long after everything man has ever built has crumbled into dust. In the event the spacecraft encounter alien intelligence, both Voyagers carry a copper phonograph record, a message, celebrating the sights and sounds of Earth. and it's the first cut on the Sounds of Earth record. It's not actually with the music, and it's not actually a musical composition of mine. It's a realization of Kepler's harmony of the planets. That they move in harmonic relationships with each other, and that the ear of God can hear these harmonies of the celestial bodies moving in their cycles and their rhythms and that maybe someday there will be a way of making this audible to the ear of man. And at that point, that was 1977, there was a way, and so I cut it up and entered all of the astronomical data and uh, made it sound as good as I could. I, I chose to use only the planets that were known at Kepler's time. So Pluto wasn't in there, and he's been demoted from being a planet since then anyway. Poor little Pluto. Kepler was this obsessive, amazing person uh, who from platonic times, from the music of the spheres, they thought the orbits, you know, would be circular back in, the, you know, Pythagorean and platonic, you know, the ancient Greeks. And Kepler went totally crazy for quite a few years trying to, to reconcile the astronomical data with that. But it turned out that he had to come up with, uh, pretty much invent, the ellipse to explain these orbits because they were not uniform. They were not circular orbits. They were elliptical. He was a genius, but he was extremely, he was obsessive. He kept at it till he figured it out. I love science too. I, mean, it's, I think Bell Labs was a natural in a way, partly also, because I am part scientist. I always loved science when I was in school. I, when I was a kid, I wanted to be an astronomer. I wanted to be an oceanographer. Um, chemistry was one of the best courses I ever, ever had in my life during high school. I would stay after school blowing things up in the chem lab uh, fairly often. Um, and during the Vietnam War, um, when they were actually hiring girls for the jobs that if they hired a guy, he would be immediately drafted as soon as he got out of school, so they couldn't. So, so there were all these jobs open to, to young women that weren't open normally and were shut down after the Vietnam War ended, which is partly why we got feminism in the 70s. But um, I, I worked as an analytical chemist as, at, at Underwriters Labs on the basis of an absolutely insanely great high school chemistry course. And I, and I liked logic and I liked math and, and I felt at home in, in a lab sort of atmosphere. Uh, so Bell Labs was a, a good fit for me. And it was a fascinating place. I mean, everybody in all the other little rooms on the floor were all totally into working on something that they were excited about because it was still an era of pure research. 
It was very long-term thinking. As today, everything's very short-term. They upgraded and decommissioned the, the computer that we had been using for music and replaced them with newer, modern computers that uh, none of our software carried over. They ran different languages. We lost everything. Everybody just really lost everything. And that was followed not much later by the divestiture, the AT&T divestiture, where they broke up AT&T into all these smaller competing companies. And that ended pure research, really, for Bell Labs, one of the all-time great research institutions, pure research institutions on the planet ever. and then people started being expected to produce innovations that would lead to an income generating product within a given time frame as opposed to leading to a Nobel Prize or coming up with something that you don't have any use for yet but will like the transistor or the laser or all the other amazing things that that had come out of those labs. <laughs> 